we please talk about your the sort of breaking in stories because you all came to film composition in a very different way. Yeah. Uh, so very briefly, just tell me how you got into film composition in the first place and was it something you aspired to growing up? Um, I kind of was very, I got very into electronic music when I was like young um, and that was, I always wanted to make just, you know, weird music. And so my sort of break into film was I, I actually did a record when I was 16, which is quite weird, of like avant-garde, weird ambient electronics called Bedroom, which I made in my bedroom. My break into film was a director's guy called Paul Wilmshurst and he'd heard this record and he really liked it. And so he asked uh, me to score a documentary, which to, to date this quite nicely was, you probably know who Janet Street Porter is. Yes. A lot of people here probably don't, but it was a, a film about this media commentator talking about how this new thing called the internet would never catch on and that it was going to be a flash in the pan and was basically going to be the equivalent of CB radio. So that was, I think, 1996 or 1995. I was still at school and I did that documentary after I did my homework on a four track and one synthesizer. And then through that, I got more documentary work and then I kept doing that. And then through that, I got some TV work, and drama work. And then one day, one of the directors I worked with asked if I wanted to do his film and it's called The Awakening. And that was like my break into film. I always play music since I was a little uh, child, like the age of four or five, maybe. It, playing was like, it, it came natural, didn't study, didn't do any, anything academic or uh, and, and then I kept playing and then up until the age of 13 where I joined the first local band in the city I, I grew up in, city of Persaid. Uh, that's a very coastal city by the Mediterranean. Jumping from one local band to another, uh, playing in very little uh, gigs, weddings and stuff like that. And then uh, I, I catch up with the film students. In, uh, in Cairo, and this happened during the age of the MIDI, when the MIDI came, when I got the chance to buy this little sequencer and in my room and home assistance it to, started to compose the first few tracks. And I like to believe by that time that this is good music. And uh, I found uh, one of those students who shared the thought with me that he liked me to do uh, music for their, uh, they, they do short films for the graduation and stuff. And so I had the chance to mess around with, the, with, the, with their pictures and do horrible score for, <laughs> for their projects. And this is how I got to learn how to do uh, stuff. Up until I, got, I was given the chance to do the first feature, this was 1996. I was always doing drama at school and drama and music and a acting and English and I wanted to study English literature for a while before I decided to get more into playing the violin so it was for me it was like those three areas like storytelling music theatre were always big interests growing up and I went to conservatoire on violin but realized I didn't want to kind of be an orchestral musician and and I was always composing on the side and then I, I heard about this film school and I applied and I got into the National Film and Television School. So that course is quite centred on, you know, you're building connections with filmmakers. I was acting and stuff and writing stuff and filming stuff and it gives you quite a kind of cohesive education, like about the whole process, which is really helpful to know because you're kind of, you know, thinking about shots and depth of field and, and it's not just about the music it's about storytelling all the time which is I think kind of a we're all interested in that as well it's it's kind of a combined art form. I was a touring musician I played in bands uh, I, I feel like my story is like the combination of the three of your stories <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we're not so different from each other <laughs> but um, yes I was playing in bands and I also studied playwriting in schools I was in theater and the, the playwriting students, like your experience, um, were also required to take a directing class and, uh, and, and acting classes. So this was not for film, but for theater, so a similar kind of storytelling. And all I ever wanted to do was play in bands. I never thought about doing film music uh, until a director saw my band play and he really liked the music we were making. And he was making his first tiny, tiny film at the time, and his name is David Lowry. 
and I have done the music for every one of his films ever since. As his career started to take off, he just took me with him and kept fighting for me to be his composer as the budgets got bigger and people were scared. <laughs> <laughs> well, The Green Knight is one of the films you're nominated for this year, another film with David Lowry. So why don't you talk about the challenges of that particular project and, and also how you work with, with David? This was the uh, eighth or ninth film for David and I. I don't, I should keep track better, but um, we have a shorthand now. And so I feel like every project gets a little bit easier and we get a little uh, more efficient at, at our process um, all the way up until the Green Knight, which was like um, being slapped across the face as if to say um, everything that we thought we knew about how much easier it was getting every time was refuted by this film, which constantly rejected our ideas for what it should be. So did you just produce lots and lots of music and it just didn't fit to the images? Is that what happened? It was 80% of the way there, but that last 20% of it wasn't, uh, wasn't the right thing. And sometimes 80% of the way there um, doesn't mean that you can keep that 80% as you find the next thing, right? You sometimes have to go back to the drawing boards um, to, to find the whole piece of music that actually fits. And have you ever experienced that issue? Oh yeah, all the time. <laughs> like, yeah, you can work, like some movies you get straight away and others you're like, like I always think the best, the best uh, sort of scores are often where you try and build in time to fail. Because I think if you're trying to do something new and different, like you've got to be able to like fuck it up basically. And if you don't have that, that runway, that space to, to, to make mistakes, I don't think you're necessarily pushing hard enough as a composer sometimes. I mean, every film is a different beast, but my favorite ones are where you can like, I don't know what, like, I don't know where this is going to go. And you try and experiment and, and, you know, make weirdness. And you can get through things, I've got through things before where you just like, you know what, this approach isn't working, let's go back to the beginning. Getting it right, right from the very beginning, it's not, it's, it's a lucky strike. Never happens because we all experience this, oh, aha, I got, did it, I got it right. And then you go like stretch your legs for a walk a few minutes or go fix something hot to drink and you get back and listen to it and it sounds like crap. It's terrible. So right? yeah, so, <laughs> or, or wait till the very next day, I was like, I was celebrating last night. <laughs> the idea what happened. And it's, yeah, I, so I normally don't do not, I get those moments of aha, and, but I don't trust them because they're, they could be deceiving. In, 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 and good ideas, fresh ideas, uh, and, and, and um, authentic ideas are persistent. Uh, so they keep, they keep nudging you, they keep calling you, they keep poking you, and you need to listen carefully. But then there are other films, like I just did this film, Amsterdam, and I did that whole thing pretty much in about a month, like from start to finish, it was crazy. And with something like that, you have to be like, okay, I've got a concept, and like, I just got to run with it. And it's like, you've got to be really confident it's going to work. It's a bit like driving a car and you're like, where are we going? And you're like, Google says it's going to take us like this much time to get this distance anyway. And we haven't got that time. So I'm just going to floor the car and go that way. And you just got to cross your fingers, it's going to work. And when you're experimenting, say on Spider-Verse 2, yeah. at which point do you, sh you know, play it to the director? I'm pretty close with them, so I'll, I'll always, I, I'll always play them stuff. Like, like I just played them the other day. I sent, you know, sometimes I, you know, because I'll text with them or email, and it's it'll just be like, right, here's what I'm thinking. Like I've just sent them a piece, and it's got me singing on it, and like, I really can't sing. Like, uh, and that's not like, oh, I can't. I'm like terrible singer. And the idea is we're going to get someone else singing it, but it's just like, what, what if we did this kind of idea on a scene, and I wouldn't do that if I wasn't have a good, like when you have a good relationship with the director, you can kind of make more of an idiot of yourself. Um, and so with them, I'll just share stuff as we go with the, the complete understanding that we're going to bin most of it. It's not like, this is it guys, see you later. I think that's really changed in the time 
that I've gone from starting out to now. It's like you used to have a thing where you'd go and have sit down and play play it, and you'd have like a. I don't know if you guys did this. You'd have a review session like every two weeks or something and you'd go in a room and watch it all through with people. And I feel like Dropbox and everything, like you can just share stuff. They're like every day people kind of want to hear new stuff. And it, I feel like that the process has really changed because tech, I don't know, people can Zoom you and it's like people want to have more contact with you nowadays than they used to. I think people, people used to kind of leave you to go off and used to kind of get more time alone in a weird way. Na and I, I don't know if that's a good or bad thing, but I've noticed it. So how, I mean, Hesham and Natalie, you work in TV as well. How does that situation differ? I mean, it, you know, it's a weekly show. Tell me about the process of writing this. Uh, we, yeah, it's a weekly show. That's, this is how it's released. It's pretty much what you've done uh, as well, Natalie. It's a, it's, we score it. I did score Moon Knight, for instance. Uh, it's like a, each episode's like a movie, it's like a film, and then done with episodes in 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 order, like done with episode one and then two and then three and up until the six. So in, and I have developed this even working on films, starting right from the beginning till the end, in a linear way. It gives me a more uh, sense of uh, build up and flow, and uh, I like to build it up from bottom up the scores even though i have the themes and motifs in my head uh beforehand i like to do it uh orderly obviously you would worked up with marvel on loki mm -hmm. so how did the star wars job come and working with john williams or working in that world and with him i think <laughs> so i came came aboard very late like i had a month and it was christmas so you know, everyone was away for the week of Christmas and then they were like, and then you've got January and then you need to start recording like February um, to begin with. So I was like, well, oh my gosh, so I worked all over Christmas and my dad had a stroke. So that was really fun. Um, <laughs> very stressful. And I had like two weeks where I was like, let's just forget scoring to picture. Like, let's nail down these themes because we didn't know if we had consent from John Williams at that point. And we knew that we had Darth Vader and all these historic Star Wars characters. And Deborah Chow said to me, like, I think we're going to have to do kind of an alternative Vader theme. And I was like, great, two, <laughs> two weeks, no, just no pressure. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> and pr young Princess Leia and an Obi theme so, and the Inquisitors and everything. So I kind of had two weeks to kind of do it all. And and then suddenly like Deborah rang, she was like, Kathleen Kennedy's been out for dinner with John and he wants to do a theme for Benny because he's the only um, character from the Star Wars history that John hasn't written a theme for. And I think that's gonna be, I was like, amazing. This is this is so helpful. And then this unlocks, the we can use the Vader theme in episode six and you can lead there and you know we can work with all of his material which i think was just the correct move for the show mm. and for me like a dream because john williams is a kind of hero of mine and i you know grown up listening to et and you know he's kind of one of the reasons why i got into being a film composer um so yeah that that just it, it was very quick and and um, he, John only had two weeks because he was in the middle of working on Indiana Jones and it was his, he was sent, he sent a sketch for the Obi theme over and I just received it and I was playing this sketch from John Williams and it was, yeah, it was, it was just <laughs> insane. I, I, I can't believe that that actually happened. I'm still pinching myself. <laughs> <laughs> I want to know how, but actually how did both you, because both your scores like Green Knight and, and Moon Knight, the night films yeah. like because they feature like such interesting instrumentation like how did you d like go through that process because that's the hardest thing I find in demos is like if you're not using like conventional easy samples that exist how do you get those through the process um, with the directors and all that kind of stuff you, you mean how did we do the markup to yeah to, to if you're, if you're using stuff that is different, you know, that's the thing. It's like, if you're, if you're, using, if you're writing, for, if you're trying to be different, it's hard because the tools don't exist. You know, sometimes I bring a friend to do, um, to do a quick recording okay. or you just promise <laughs> by heart that it's going to sound good. <laughs> it Cause, works. Because like, yeah. Green Knight is like, it's such an amazing score, but, yeah. but it, it's like half that score, it's not just the writing, it's the sound of it and the vibe of it and the feel. And it's like, 
But I guess you've worked with him for ages, so he's, you, you can do the promising thing, right? Uh, A24 as a distributor is very forgiving and, and, and patient. Yeah. So those two things made it easier for me. But as you're saying, uh, there's a, lar a large voice in the score is a recorder quartet. Um, recorders. Yeah. And, uh, Thanks, I wouldn't have known otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> that was just for you, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and a lot of it was... Um, experimental, kind of aleatoric, stuttering, uh, extended techniques stuff. Yeah. There's no sample library for this. Yeah. Uh, so I found the one recorder sample library that I could find, and it sounded that? very, uh, I think it's called Embertone. Okay, yeah. Embertone. And, and, and em em <laughs> Embertone, that yeah. sounds like a copyright infringement. <laughs> <laughs> for, and like Renaissance recorder playing it's a great library right okay. but for doing that, 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 that yeah. stuff that it doesn't sound like anything on that so those parts of the mock-ups didn't sound that great so then I uh, bought I went out and bought a recorder and did some of the parts myself at home to make it more realistic to give a better idea yeah. of what it could eventually be so is that kind of the ideal to be brought on right at the beginning of the process I rather than having it shot and then handed to you I think you get the best result. Like if I was like, like statistically, I think you're going to get the best score when the composer is involved all the way through the process. You get the most interesting score. I, do, I think there's a step further than that. I think you get the best score when it's a long-term collaboration as yeah. well, and you have like the confidence to be able to go, "Oh, trust, trust me," and you've built trust up because sometimes having a long lead-in time with someone who doesn't trust you is hellish. Oh yeah, that's, that, that, yeah, I mean that makes, yeah, I, I mean to be honest, the trust and relationship with the director is the most important thing. And so when you've got that, you know, I promise, like I, I, I've done like three films with Aaron Sorkin now, and for the last one being the Ricardos, this big ends, my demos are pretty crap to be honest, and the, the big ending, which is this big like sweeping string sort of piece, orchestral piece, it's gonna sound crap in demos. You know, if you're gonna hold some nice, lazy pads down it will sound great but i didn't want to write that way but i knew the demos would not do it justice and i was like look i know this is the entire end of the film when everything is all like leaning on this moment working but you got to trust me it's going to be it's going to be fine and he was like okay great i trust you we've done three films now and we've, we've worked through the kinks of like you know being a bit unsure about things. And now he's like, if you say it's gonna be fine, it's gonna be fine. And it was great. So but I wouldn't have been able to do that with a director I hadn't got that relationship with because he'd be like, the demo sounds like garbage. And I'm like, yeah, but it's gonna be good. And I think that, that makes a really big difference. John Williams, I mean, he sits <laughs> with a stopwatch and an architect's table and just writes manuscript out and no one hears anything. Like, and, and he doesn't do mock-ups. Because yeah. Deborah was like, could you, is there any chance I could hear it? And I was like, and, well, if you play the piano, I can send you the score, but you're not, you know, it's like, and so the first time the director hears the score is in the recording studio. And this is like the way it was That's the, the way 1950s. it was. But it was but cool to see that that still happens. Only for John. <laughs> I, know, I, know, I think John's I, the only one. I think that's one of those things, like, if you write that kind of, uh, like, John Williams' music, which is, like, harmonically and musically, like, so complex and beautiful, it's, the reason we don't get much like that these days um, is because it, the process d sort of doesn't allow it, because, you know, if you're doing that kind of stuff and you suddenly got to edit it and they've cut the scene, they've changed it, those kind of pieces are really hard to rewrite. You know, if you've got like a piece that's chug, 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 eh, chug, 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 eh, eh. Yeah, you can take some of the chugs out and re-edit it. Um, but when you're writing stuff, you know, it is really hard if you're writing very musical, um, you're trying to write... Like symphonic kind yeah, of... Yeah, you're trying to write symphonic stuff and you're like, I need these chords, one, two, three, four, and it's got to have this movement here, so this bit plays off here. And I need this whole section to, to work to go from, you know, chord one to chord nine or whatever and if I lose any of those the whole thing's not going to work and it becomes really hard because if you're with a you know if you're with a team who are chop chop in the edit you you know that that's going to get obliterated so you, I will write in different ways with different films and different relationships with people because there's no point writing something musically really complicated if it's it's going to get like cut to 
cut to shreds. It was really interesting with the John Williams's music editor because there's that thing in ET where it goes and that was a music edit, like the yeah that's a that's a music edit. It wasn't in the score. No, it wasn't in the score originally. So he did they he did have a music editor, but and then I saw this clip of him recording to streamers with Spielberg and you know he was they couldn't quite get the bike lift off to happen right. so they just re-edited the film around the music and yeah. i think that i think that doesn't happen very often either no. does it no. if the film isn't working you're the last person that can do something right. about it as well yeah I mean, you're the editor so you just, yeah you're like the punch <laughs> bag it's like you're the last man standing yeah <laughs> or not yeah it's like they're like well we've got to blame we've got to blame someone we can't blame anyone here so we'll blame you <laughs> bye <laughs> so what about the dreaded temp music do you like that well i try and get like i will try and like a really good thing for coming onto a film early is creating your own temp music and that's in, in probably the most important thing is I will try and, if I'm coming on early, I'll write stuff and we'll start throwing it against the film. And that way the film starts to take on the, um, the, the marriage between the film and your, your music works a lot better. But I, I sort of purposefully avoid films that will be tempt in a, in a way. Like I try not to do, like I always try and do films that are unusual in there, like that allow me a chance to, do something individualistic rather than do films where they want me to copy temp music. But I guess I've been quite lucky in that regards. But it, it, it will mean I'll turn down a really big film because I know it's going to be temp with a gazillion superhero scores that, and they'll, they'll sort of, I know that the process will end up like that. So I try and avoid those films. I'd rather do a small quirky indie one where I can be more myself. What about you guys? Temp music, good or bad? I can't think of a composer who likes that track. I mean, who does? I mean, I think it's because I think it's one or two who say like, "This is my shortcut. This is the only way I can get it done in time. I have to have this reference from the director, otherwise we'll be arguing later." But I only know of one person who feel, feels that way. It can be useful though. Like sometimes it's like they got to work out what what it is. Yeah. Like my favorite temp music is bad temp music. Yeah. Because you can come in and make it look yeah, better. My, exactly. The worst yeah. temp music is good temp music, yeah. where they're like, this scene just works, and you're like... Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. What or, do you do in that situation, then? Um, it's a nightmare. It's a real, real nightmare. It's like, I haven't, I've only had it a few times. Um, I've never had to, like, like, kind of do anything that sounds like something else. And I've been, I, I, actually, I can't believe I've got away with that, because I really... It is really hard when you hear, like I've watched movies and I've, I hear my music in them that's been ripped off and I'm like, yeah, they're ripping off my track. The beat's gonna come in now. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Is that when you call your agent? <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm normally pretty chill about it. There've been a couple where I'm like, yeah. Cause it's really hard cause every, every composer's in the same boat. So it's like, you know, um, you know, we all like, I know the pain they'll be going through and they, they won't want to do it either. There are ones where I'm like, really? Come on, you could have done... Like when you hear it done quite well, I'm like, all right, fair play. Yeah, there's, uh, yeah I can't mention them because I'm just getting in trouble. But there's some others where I'm like, I'm like, oh, that is literally my track. <laughs> <laughs> so before we wrap up, I just need to ask you all about uh, the World Soundtrack Awards and its place in kind of film composition. Can you just give me... Uh, a well, I was love coming to World Soundtrack Awards because I get to hang out with other composers, get to hang out with people who actually like film music. They're probably all in this room, the entire world of film soundtrack fans. But, but being here, I, I knew ahead of time that Natalie would be here and we're friends. And I was like, great, I get to see Natalie. Check, uh, check one, you know, plus one for World Soundtrack Awards. Uh. And I really want to, I've never met either uh, Hesham or Daniel and I want to talk to both of them about works of theirs that I really admire. So I'm like, uh, plus two, plus three. There we go. I'm like building up all these lists. And uh, since I've been here, everybody's been so sweet to me. And um, yeah, couldn't ask for a better situation. Can I ask one last question? What are you all working on now? Spider Verse Two. <laughs> uh, I'm working on a, a, a TV a series about a historic figure in in the Arab history, ancient Arab history, called Muawiyah. Cool. Yeah. Natalie. Loki season two. Great. Uh, I just finished a TV show called Interview with the Vampire. 
And so at the moment, I'm not technically working on anything, but when I go back home, I'll start on another TV show and another movie. Great. Thank you very much indeed.